I'm Nick, and today on Trail Made, we're going to be fixing my death wobble by replacing my balls and knuckles. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, so you probably saw the last video that we had, which was Mamba Flex's walk around. Uh, before we do one for Gertie, I wanted to get some upgrades under her. Uh, right now I'm having a little bit of an issue with bump steer, uh, as well as a little bit of death wobble. Um, and I've contributed to a few different factors. Um, and I got some parts here that we're gonna install that should hopefully eliminate that. I got one more that we're gonna do on a future video. Uh, but right now I just wanna do a quick walkthrough of what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, so this isn't necessarily gonna help but it's something that we're gonna do in the process because I have to drain the diff in order to get to these parts. Uh, I got a Yukon differential cover for the front. It's really nice and sturdy. It could take a beating. I actually just dropped this right when we were about to film and landed on a rock and it's perfectly fine. So that's a great endorsement right there. Reed knuckles. Now these are gonna be really important. The JLs come with aluminum knuckles right from the factory. Um, it's great for weight savings, but it's not great as far as wear. Uh, when you throw 37 inch tires on your Jeep, uh, what's naturally going to happen is there's going to be a lot of pulling forces and the softer metal is going to start getting eaten away, whether it's by the tie rod or the drag link that's attached to it. So these are going to make sure that they're much more stable moving forward, shouldn't run into any issues. And then I think the main contributor to my death wobble is the factory ball joints. They're notoriously bad. Um, they have a part that has plastic that hits metal. Anytime you have that happen, it's just gonna start eating away at the softer material, which is the plastic. So the longer you have them on the Jeep, the more of a problem it's gonna become. The TerraFlex ones actually just came out. They were some of the most popular ball joints for the JKs. Uh, they have really easy grease ports right here. So it's gonna be easy to service even once I go up to RCVs. Um, they're a great product. They're built really well. Uh, I'm actually gonna have one of the first uh, sets to be put on the JL. So really look forward to that install. Um, just so you guys know a little bit of the background as far as where I come from. I never used to work on my cars uh, before I had the Jeep. So now that we're doing all these installs for the JL, I'm gonna to try to do it as simple as possible, make it as easy for people to understand, but I'm gonna be learning just as much as you guys are. So if it's something that I can do, you guys can definitely do it as well. So looking forward to sharing the experience of installing all this stuff. Maybe we'll get a few more installs done later today, but for now, let's start with these. Let's get it going. All right, so in order to get to where the ball joints are, which are right here, what we need to do first is we need to take off the tie rod. We have to take off all the brake components, and then we gotta get into the axle shaft area. So that's gonna be the step-by-step -step process. I'll walk you through the different sizes of the tools that you need, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna start with the 21 in order to get this tie rod off. All right, so we're taking these nuts off, put that right back on top. If it's stuck on there, mine's been on here for a little while, so it is pretty stuck. So you just hit a few times, wait for it to drop, and that'll catch it for you right there. Take this off now. And we're just gonna hang it. So it's out of the way for us. So next we're gonna be taking off the brake caliper. There's two bolts, they're 21 millimeter. Uh, I had to use a breaker bar to loosen them up, and now we're just gonna zap them off. One of them is going to be located right here. The other one's going to be a little bit further up right here. Anything you do, you want to make sure you're not stretching this out, the brake line, and you want to make sure to avoid it at any cost. All right, so when you're taking the brake caliper off, like I said, you don't want to put any tension here on this brake line. So it just pulls right off. You're going to rest it right over here, but you're also going to attach it. It's got little bungee cords that slip right through here, and they're uh, hung up over there on the tower. So that's going to keep all the tension off this line. You can see it's nice and out of the way now, and we can get back to working on this. All right, so there's a little bolt right here that retains the rotor. It's a T30. A little bit of pressure is all it takes. Be nice and careful. 
Um, there are a few people that say this is a T25, but the T30 fits perfectly. You're not gonna have to worry about any problems. All right, so a few taps to the rotor should usually loosen it up enough. And there we go, easy peasy. There we go, keep that out of the way somewhere it's not gonna get scratched. Taking off the three 10 millimeter bolts that hold on the, uh, the dust screen. Real easy. All right, so whenever you have these bolts coming out, put them right back to where they were. It's the easiest way to make sure you don't lose them. I'm notorious for misplacing stuff, so this makes it easier whenever you're going through one of these processes. All right, so we got a five millimeter right here. If you have a lot of dust over in this area, just clean it off a little bit with a little bit of brake cleaner. Uh, you don't want anything to go into this hole. Once you pull it out, it's where the cone ring is. That'll create all sorts of problems. And very gently pull on this. Like I said earlier, put the bolt right back in. The other one we need to do is right here. This is a 13 millimeter. And this is so you have access right here to the ball joint. It's on here pretty good. All right, once you take both of these off, just kind of secure them out of the way because this is where you're going to be doing the primary amount of your work. Just over here where they're going to be safe along with the cat the caliper. All right, next we're going to take off this bolt that holds the uh, axle shaft assembly together. It's a 36. This is kind of the only odd size uh, adapter that you need for this project. But it should buzz right off. All right, perfect. All right, so now there's three of these guys right here. Uh, these are 13 millimeter, but they're 12 point. Uh, I have the little adapter on there to let it get at it at an angle. It makes it a leap. One. Two. And the other one, come to the other side, it's right here. It's hard to miss. All right, once you get those three bolts out, the axle assembly should be pretty easy to pull out. You wanna make sure though that you're not yanking it too hard. You want this to come out nice and easy. Um, and you do have seals on the inside of your axle. So you're gonna to need to support your shaft once it starts coming out. But a few little wiggles. And here's the top part. And now for the main thing, give it a little bit of jerk. It should slide right out. Like I said, keep it supported. You don't want to mess up any of those seals that are inside. And mine's surprisingly not that bad. So we need to get these little cotter pins out here so we can get to the castle nuts underneath. But it's holding. All right, so after you don't struggle for 10 minutes to get the cotter pins out, you can get to the castle nuts and they're relatively easy. You wanna, just like we did earlier, loosen them, but leave a little bit of thread on there because we're gonna be needing hitting the knuckle right here. And you don't want it to just fall down on the ground. So, loosen. Right there. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be hitting right here with the dead blow. I got a 45 ounce. And it takes a few good whacks. It is aluminum though, like I said earlier. So you don't really want to be hitting it with a regular metal hammer. Just to keep working it with the dead blow. Alright, so we hit it with a little WD-40, let it sink in there, give it just another good couple whacks. Pretend like we haven't been whale on this for 20 minutes and oh, it drops down. Just look at that. Uh, so now what you can do is take the castle nuts off. This washer, hold on to it though. You're gonna need that for the later step. Undo the bottom as well. And there's the old knuckle. All right, so next step is to get the existing ball joints out. You need a ball joint removal kit. This is like a Maddox one. It was like 80 bucks over at Harbor Freight. Uh, but the general setup is pretty easy. Pretty much you have this main C part of the, the, the tool, uh, which is gonna be applying pressure, the rod, which will attach uh, 
a ratchet to as much as we can, and then we'll eventually use a breaker bar. It's gonna be pushing on the top of the existing ball joint um, into this cylinder, which is hollow on the inside. It touches only the, the axle itself. It doesn't make any contact with the ball joint, so there's a big hole for the ball joint to just fall through and it has this cap on the bottom which attaches to the C um, and it has a spot for the bottom of the ball joint to fall through as well. So pretty straightforward. We'll keep doing this until we can't anymore, which is about right now. And then we'll use a breaker bar to get all the way. Right here. You can see that the more that we torque it down, it's falling through, and any second now it should fall through all the way, right into that cup. And it's getting looser, it should be right now. All right, so like I said, when you're removing your ball joints, you wanna do the top one first. The reason being is that this rod that comes with the uh, ball joint removal kit has to actually go through the hole where the top ball joint uh, used to exist. So exact same setup, cup here on the bottom, which is surrounding the entirety of the ball joint. All the corners are making contact with the actual axle itself. Nothing's making contact with the ball joint. Everything's lined up. I'm just gonna use a torque wrench and same as before, just keep applying slow steady torque. There are some people that use impact wrenches for this, but there's a pretty high chance of getting everything a little bit misaligned. Um, if you got a buddy to help you out with this, I definitely recommend utilizing them just to make sure that everything stays nice and straight. Uh, but this one I can already tell is gonna be a little bit easier. It's starting to loosen up already. I have to do it with one hand. Uh, so it should just be a few more turns. And it's off. All right, so the ball joints for the driver's side are both out. Um, just as I suspected, they're very loose. Uh, it takes pretty much no effort to get them to move around. Uh, the top one was a little bit more loose than the bottom, but it's still pretty, both pretty bad. Uh, compared to the TerraFlex, like, you have to put a good amount of pressure in order to move it even like a tiny little bit. There's not much of a comparison. All right, so we're getting this ready to put the new ball joints in. It's always a good idea to just kind of clean out any surfaces that might have a little gunk on them. Uh, nothing, don't spray this too much, uh, but just make sure all these surfaces are gonna be mating together, are free of any dirt, debris. We'll also be putting some anti-seize in here to make the process go a little easier. Um, right here, if there's any loose dirt right in the axle shaft tube, just clear that out. So that's looking pretty good right there. Anytime you have an opportunity to clean your surfaces, definitely take advantage of it. All right, so the Terraflex has specific upper and lower ones. They make it real easy to see. L on the bottom for lower, U on the bottom for upper. So um, the, it's important that you do this, one, because the actual length of the shaft is a little bit different, uh, but also because the fittings for where you're gonna be greasing need to be facing in different directions. So on the top, the grease fittings need to be facing away from the axle, so towards the wheel. And then on the bottom, it's reverse. So the ports need to be facing towards the axle on the bottom. And this is just gonna allow for easy maintenance without having to take anything off, including RCVs. If you run those type of axles, um, you can still service them easily with just a grease gun. What we're gonna be doing is putting some anti-season here just to make it nice and easy. Get it spread nice and evenly in there. So like I said, we're doing the bottom one first. Now it's really important that we get the orientation of the actual ball joint correct. So you can see I put little marks on here, yellow, and the two Zerk fittings are fitting towards the axle on the bottom. So pretty much the whole time that it's tightening up, it's gonna be putting pressure for it to go straight up, but since there's a little bit of a turning motion to make this whole thing work, it's naturally gonna to wanna to turn clockwise as well. So we just gotta make sure that up until it's seated well in here, all these lines line up correctly. So the general way that we're gonna be doing this is pretty simple. Um, so we have the ball joint sitting on open cylinder right here. The bottom of the ball joint is going through this fitting and through the bottom of this C-clamp. On the top part, we just need to make sure there's enough clearance for this once the ball joint comes out and this completely surrounds the axle hole. So 
put that right there. Make sure it's nice and centered. Lift this up. Make sure we stay aligned. And you can notice that the top of this tool is actually coming through the top spot. So that's why it's important to make sure you get these done in the correct order. Um, but we're just gonna tighten this up and make sure that everything lines up before we start putting some pressure on it. Um, we might try using the impact, but chances are we'll end up just finishing it with the, the, uh, the torque wrench. That's nice and lined up right over the hole. This line and this line are perfect. It started actually with the torque wrench. You can see what I mean that this is naturally going to want to turn a little bit. And I'm just holding on to the C part. And actually, nothing's turning, so we're looking good. Just make sure that the orientation is nice and even. And we're going in the right way. Slow and steady pressure. And you can see that that gap is getting smaller and smaller. nice and flush and there's not much more pressure we could put on it that's looking pretty dang good we'll take this off right now and see what we have all right so the bottom one's in pretty easy process if you want to take a look at what the finished product looks like you'll notice on the bottom that it looks uneven at the top. It looks like this part's sticking up further than the other, but that's because the bottom of this axle is actually at an angle. When we do the top one, you'll see that it's actually nice and flush because the bottom's nice and flush, but this is what it should look like on the bottom. It should be higher up here. We'll do the Zerks in a second after we do the top one, uh, but let's move forward with the next one. All right, so we got everything ready to go for the top one next. So we got the C-clamp, got a base that has a hole in it. So the bottom of the, the ball joint, I could actually touch it through the hole in the bottom of the C. You've got the barrel that surrounds the ball joint but does not make contact with the swivel part of the ball joint. There's the ball joint right here with a line that orients with the line that I put in the middle of the axle. Just a little cap that's taller than the top of the ball joint. And then obviously the press is put down on that. So it's here. Just slow and steady, making sure that everything stays where it's supposed to. And we should start seeing this little gap right here to close up. And this one, since I said the bottom is actually even, we should see everything pressing up evenly on this one. And we'll take off the cap. We'll know we did it right if the part that's sticking out above the axle is nice and even as well. So everything's nice and flush here. Actually need to get that in there a little bit more. Right, so let's reverse this. Take it off and see what we got. And we have a well seated ball joint right there. This whole ring on the top, like I said, is nice and even. We have a snap ring that we'll put on in just a second here. But this came out beautifully. Uh, the bottom is nice and flush, and the lines were nice and evenly lined up there. So we put the Zerk fittings on here. I got one castle nut on here. Make sure to put the sleeve that came off the original knuckle on. It should go all the way up, and there's a flat part on there that lines up with uh, the body of the reed knuckle. I'm just gonna put that castle nut on as well. Next up, we got a 
tighten these things down to spec. Okay. All right, so we need to torque these down. We need to go 15, 55, then back down to the bottom and tighten that to 33. So we'll start with 15. And this is a 22 milli millimeter socket. All right, so once the capsule nuts are in, you gotta put the cotter pin. Usually one of these I like to go under and loop underneath the actual bolt. Uh, the other one I like to wrap around, so that's gonna be the way that we do it. Just get some pliers, it's a little bit of a pain, but uh, these are, once you get them, they're not too hard to bend. But you just do that for the top and bottom, and then we're gonna start the process of reassembling everything. All right, so now that we're gonna begin the process of putting everything back, Axle shaft is gonna be the first end. Same as when we took it out, there is a seal on here that needs to be avoided. Go nice and slow and keep it supported as it goes in. That looks like it's fitting in there nicely. this it should fit back on you nicely and remember to keep this part up and facing towards the front of the vehicle there we go just line up your bolts and then it's the 13 millimeter 12 point socket that you're going to be using to get these bolts back in here on the back side, and we're bringing those back up to 75 foot pounds of torque. Over here. And there's a third one right down here. All right, so we ended up putting everything back. This part attached up to the top using the 30 millimeter. Got the dust shield back on, which is 10 millimeters. Got this put back in, which is the five millimeter. Um, next up is going to be the rotor and the brake calipers. So just going backwards from the way that we did it. Um, and we're just about done with this side. Okay, so we've done all the tightening up. This nut is back on. Uh, we made sure that the brakes were all torqued to spec. We attached the tie rod. All that's left to do is just put the wheel back on and we're all set to go and uh, tackle the second side. Hey guys, as you can probably hear, the wind was getting pretty bad, so we had to stop the recording. Uh, but all that was left was just throwing the wheels on there, and we were done with the installation after we did the second side. Um, it's been about a week now since the knuckles and ball joints got put on, and it has made a huge difference. I know there's a lot of reviews out there that say that whatever part they put on completely changed the ride of their vehicle. This is definitely one of those installations. Um, it drives completely different. It used to be that every single pothole, every single time I went over railroad tracks, I would either get bump steer where it's this huge amount of plate out of nowhere that goes through the steering wheel or I would just get good old death wobble that the steering stabilizer kind of took care of uh, but it was never addressing the problem. Uh, the ball joints, like I said, um, they were really loose. Uh, at least two of them were, so there was a lot of problems with that. Um, translated to really loose steering. And then the knuckles, the aluminum one, like we talked about earlier, um, they're lightweight, uh, but they're not very durable. So the spots where the steer smarts metal washers were rubbing up against them, and this is just a regular spec that steer smart indicates, they were eating away at the material on the aluminum, which was causing a little bit more play. Um, it's pretty well divided out. So you can tell that there's definitely somewhere that has come from riding on 37 inch tires overall the installation was moderate difficulty probably you definitely have to have some specialized tools it helped to have a couple friends that were helping along the way um, but it's definitely something that is doable in the driveway with a good maybe about five to seven hours is what I would recommend uh, to realistically do this install um, but yeah the, the the ride has been completely different. Um, we are going to be installing a steer smart sector, uh, sector shaft brace here pretty soon. So that should even uh, tighten up my steering even more. But looking forward to sharing that install with you guys. But we'll do a checkup on these products in about six months to let you know how they're holding up. Uh, but as of right now, I'm incredibly happy with them. Definitely check out the Terra Flex ball joints. Check out the Reed Knuckles. They made huge improvements on Gertie, especially with her... Um, really bad steering problems uh, and I think they could definitely help your guys' uh, rigs as well. So thanks so much for watching and we'll see you on the next one. With the metal grinding up against it, you got the pressure of the 37s 
on Gertie. <laughs> and yeah, that's uh, what we got going on. <laughs>